Chemical reactions involve energy changes, but how can we predict these changes without performing an experiment every time? Why do some reactions release heat while others absorb it? And why do substances like graphite and diamond, both made of carbon, have such different stabilities? To answer these questions, we need to explore enthalpy changes and energy cycles. And in this video, we'll examine how we measure energy changes using enthalpy and calorimetry. And we'll apply Hess's law to calculate enthalpy changes through multiple methods, including the Born-Haber cycle, to understand the formation of ionic compounds. The law of the conservation of energy states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transferred or converted from one form to another. This means that Within our universe, the total amount of energy must remain constant. In a chemical reaction, the total energy before and after the reaction must then remain the same in a closed system. When bonds break, energy is absorbed from the surroundings to overcome the attractive forces holding the atoms together. When new bonds form, energy is then released as atoms stabilize to form a lower energy state. This energy is then transferred back to the surroundings. Energy can be transferred in multiple ways, like heat, work, or radiation. For now, we'll focus on the transfer of heat, and we'll use enthalpy to describe these energy changes. Enthalpy, H, is a measure of the chemical potential energy stored in a system. Change in enthalpy, delta H, represents the net difference between the energy of the reactants and products in a chemical reaction. If more energy is absorbed than released, delta H is positive, and we say the reaction is endothermic. If more energy is released than absorbed, delta H is negative, and we say the reaction is exothermic. Our definitions for endothermic and exothermic are of the perspective of the reaction system, but for us and the surroundings, Endothermic reactions will feel cold, because they are absorbing heat. Exothermic reactions would then feel hot, as they are releasing heat. The flow of energy can be difficult to measure directly. Practically speaking, one common way that we make these measurements is through calorimetry. In a calorimetry experiment, reactants are placed in an insulated container to minimize heat loss. Instead of measuring energy directly, we measure temperature changes in water or another surrounding medium to determine how much heat was absorbed or released by the chemical system. From this, we can calculate a standardized change in enthalpy for the reaction, showing how heat is either gained or lost when one mole of the reaction occurs under standard conditions. For us in the classroom, conducting calorimetry experiments for every reaction would be impractical. Instead, we'll use many standardized calorimetry experiments that have already been conducted to determine the enthalpy changes for common reactions. These data allow us to calculate the enthalpy change of almost any reaction that we're interested in without performing an experiment every time. Enthalpy is a state function, meaning that the total enthalpy change of a reaction is independent of the reaction's path taken. This principle is the foundation of Hess's law. Through Hess's law, there are in fact many ways that we can calculate a reaction's change in enthalpy. Let's discuss a few. Bond enthalpy refers to the energy required to break one mole of a particular bond in a gaseous state. As we saw before, breaking bonds is an endothermic process, as energy is needed to overcome the attractive forces holding the atoms together. From standardized bond enthalpy data, we can calculate the overall change in enthalpy of a reaction by taking the difference between the sum of the bond enthalpies of the bonds broken minus the sum of the bond enthalpies of the bonds formed. For this calculation, we're treating every bond in the reactants as if it were being broken, and every bond in the products as if it were being formed. By subtracting the bonds formed, we are flipping the sign of their bond enthalpy values. This works as the energy lost when a bond is broken is equal to the energy gained when the same bond is being formed. Let's examine the combustion of methane and use the enthalpy data for the bonds within our reactants and products. 
For bond entropies, it's helpful to think in terms of each molecule's Lewis structure. From this and our enthalpy data, we can calculate the change in enthalpy in the reaction. We'll take the sum of the bond enthalpies for breaking four moles of carbon to hydrogen single bonds and two moles of oxygen to oxygen double bonds and subtract the bond enthalpies for forming two moles of carbon to oxygen double bonds and four moles of oxygen to hydrogen single bonds. This gives an enthalpy of a reaction equal to negative 808 kilojoules per mole. One important note is that our bond enthalpy data is not perfect. In fact, they represent average bond enthalpy values. Different chemical environments lead to different enthalpy values between a bond shared between the same two atoms. To overcome this, we create average bond enthalpy values to complete calculations like we just did. This gives us useful estimates for reactions change in enthalpy. Instead of using bond enthalpies, we can instead reference the individual enthalpy of formation values for each of our reactants and products, and complete a more precise calculation for a reaction's change in enthalpy. Enthalpy of formation represents the enthalpy change when one mole of a compound is formed from elements in their standard states under standard conditions. This standardization ensures consistency and easy comparison across reactions. For example, in the formation of water from oxygen and hydrogen gas, we have an enthalpy of formation equal to negative 285.8 kilojoules per mole. In the formation of methane from carbon graphite and hydrogen gas, we have an enthalpy of formation of negative 74.8 kilojoules per mole. Elements in their standard states, like H2O2 or carbon graphite, have an enthalpy of formation of zero kilojoules per mole. That's because elements in their standard states are already in their most stable natural form, so no energy is needed to form them. What about elements that exist in different forms, like carbon? Graphite and diamond, two allotropes of carbon, have different enthalpy of formation values due to their distinct structures. Graphite, the most stable form of carbon under standard conditions, has an enthalpy of formation of zero kilojoules per mole and acts as the reference state for carbon. Diamond, on the other hand, has an enthalpy of formation of 1.88 kilojoules per mole, reflecting the additional energy required to convert carbon atoms into diamond's highly ordered lattice structure. This energy difference is why diamond is less thermodynamically stable than graphite, even though diamond is more durable due to its strong covalent bonding. Let's apply enthalpies of formation in our new equation to the combustion of methane, whose enthalpy of reaction we previously calculated using average bond enthalpies. Here, we're taking products minus reactants. We subtract the sum of the enthalpy of formation values for the reactants, since enthalpy of formation values are always given for compound formation. Also note that N in this equation represents the moles of each species from the reaction's balanced chemical equation. Referencing our standardized enthalpy of formation data, we take the sum of the enthalpy of formation of one mole of carbon dioxide and two moles of H2O minus the sum of the enthalpy of formation of one mole of methane and two moles of oxygen. This gives an enthalpy of reaction of negative 891 kilojoules per mole. In comparison to our previous calculation using bond enthalpies, which yielded an enthalpy of reaction of negative 808 kilojoules per mole, we can confidently state that our new value is more accurate. Bond enthalpy calculations provide useful estimates, but enthalpy of formation values are experimentally determined and not averages, making them significantly more reliable. Interestingly, you may also measure the enthalpy of a reaction using its enthalpy of combustion. Enthalpy of combustion refers to the enthalpy change when one mole of a substance undergoes complete combustion in excess oxygen under standard conditions. Because combustion reactions are highly exothermic, enthalpy of combustion values are always negative. Knowing the enthalpies of reaction, combustion, or formation for different reactions will be particularly useful for finding other unknown enthalpy changes. Multi-step reactions allow us to use Hess's law when a reaction can be broken up into smaller steps. Since enthalpy is a state function, 
the overall enthalpy change for a reaction depends only on the initial and final states, not the path taken. This means that if we can find known enthalpy changes for individual steps of a reaction, we can rearrange and sum these values to determine the unknown enthalpy of their overall reaction. For example, in the combustion of methane, instead of calculating the enthalpy change directly, we can break this reaction into multiple steps using known enthalpy values. We have the formation of carbon dioxide from carbon and oxygen, the formation of water from hydrogen and oxygen, and the formation of methane from its elements. The goal is to add each of these steps to recreate the combustion of methane. Items on the same side of the reaction will add together, while identical items on opposite sides of the reaction will cancel out. With that in mind, we'll need to first double the coefficients of the reactants and products in step two to cancel out hydrogens and match what we find in the overall reaction for oxygen and water. This will in turn double the enthalpy change for this step. We'll also need to reverse step three so that methane is a reactant instead of a product. When we reverse a reaction, we in turn flip the sign of its enthalpy change. In this case, a negative 74.8 becomes a positive 74.8. Now with our reactions adding up to create the combustion of methane, we can take the sum of their known change in enthalpy values and find an overall change in enthalpy equal to negative 890.3 kilojoules per mole. This result closely matches what we found using enthalpies of formation. By applying Hess's law to multi-step reactions, we can calculate enthalpy changes even when direct measurements are not available. Our final application of Hess's law is the Born-Haber cycle, which breaks down the formation of ionic compounds into multiple steps. We'll examine the formation of sodium chloride, NaCl. To find the enthalpy of formation for sodium chloride, we must consider the energy requirements of each step in the process of turning sodium and chlorine in their natural states into a solid lattice of sodium and chloride ions. For sodium, this journey begins with the atomization of solid sodium into sodium gas. This costs about 107 kilojoules of energy per mole of sodium. Next, we'll need to ionize our gaseous sodium. Sodium tends to form a positive ion and will lose an electron to form Na+. The energy required to remove an electron from an atom is called its ionization energy. For sodium, its first ionization energy is equal to 496 kilojoules per mole. Now turning our attention to chlorine, we'll need to go through a similar process and transform our 1 half moles of chlorine gas into chloride ions that are ready to bond with our newly formed sodium ions. In nature, chlorine is found as the diatomic Cl2. For our purposes, we'll need to break our chlorine to chlorine bonds and form neutral chlorine atoms. Doing this to our half mole of diatomic chlorine molecules requires an additional 121 kilojoules of energy, which is half the bond enthalpy of one mole of chlorine molecules. Chlorine, unlike sodium, has a tendency to form a negative charge and will gain an electron to form the chloride ion. The energy required for an atom to gain an electron is called its electron affinity, and in chlorine's case, this is an exothermic process, releasing 349 kilojoules of energy per mole. Finally, with gaseous sodium and chloride ions, we can now form ionic bonds and create our solid sodium chloride crystal lattice structure. While we may not know this directly, we do know its exact counterpart, the lattice enthalpy of sodium chloride, which equals a positive 786 kilojoules per mole. For IB chemistry, lattice enthalpy is defined as the energy required to break one mole of a solid ionic compound into gaseous ions, and is always, therefore, an endothermic value. We could see this with sodium chloride, where solid sodium chloride is broken into gaseous sodium and chloride ions. For our calculation of sodium chloride's enthalpy of formation, we actually want to do the opposite of this. We're taking sodium and chloride ions and forming a solid crystal lattice structure. If our original lattice enthalpy represents the lattice enthalpy of dissociation, breaking things apart, here we would reference a lattice enthalpy of formation, or negative lattice enthalpy, 
where we're putting things back together. As with any reaction, reversing our reaction equation will flip the sign of our enthalpy value, this time releasing 786 kilojoules of energy per mole. For our calculation, we want to keep this in mind, as we'll ultimately subtract sodium chloride's lattice enthalpy in our quest to find its enthalpy of formation. In doing so, we find that sodium chloride has an enthalpy of formation value equal to a negative 411 kilojoules per mole. The Born-Haber cycle reveals how individual energy changes contribute to the stability of an ionic compound, allowing us to visualize the cost and payoff of each step in a compound's formation. For example, from the ionization of sodium and the electron affinity of chlorine, we can see the impact of attractive forces between an atom's nucleus and its outermost electrons. Or from lattice enthalpy, we can see the impact of attractive forces between our positive and negative ions, coming together to make our ionic compound. Here, the radii of each ion, as well as their individual charges, will have a great impact on the energy released in the formation of the compound. In this video, we explored how enthalpy helps us describe energy changes in chemical reactions. We learned about the various applications of Hess's law that give us multiple pathways in defining a reaction's change in enthalpy. We learned how to find enthalpy change using bond enthalpies and the energy gained and lost from making and breaking bonds how to use enthalpy changes of formation and combustion as a reference that gives us precise measurements. We learned how to use the enthalpy change from reaction steps to find information of an overall reaction, and how to read and break down the Born-Haber cycle, which helps us understand the energy changes in ionic compound formation. Mastering these concepts allows us to analyze and predict energy changes in reactions an essential tool into understanding chemical and thermodynamic processes in real-world applications.